it's kind of weird because I'm pretty sure a lot of us have been on Zoom together for like three years, and we've only seen our heads and our shoulders, and I'm a lot taller when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Mall is the Executive Director of the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. It is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving care and dignity <coughs> for residents in nursing homes and assisted living. Uh, and he is our, mo our esteemed moderator today. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. He's, he's the first in? Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. So I guess I can't look it up. Okay. So, and then I'm going to introduce over here. We have, you might recognize them, they, they are a little larger than life. One of them's still on the screen. These are the reality poets participating in our conversation today. We have Ramon Cruz, who also known as KTL. Hey, how you doing? And Francine Benjamin, reality poet, and also the resident council president at Colin. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sitting next to Richard, we have Beth Finkel, who is the stage director of AARP, or AARP which focuses on issues affecting those over the age of 50. The organization has more than 30 million members. Very grateful for everybody's presence today. We have Claudette Royal, who travels quite a distance. Claudette is the New York State Ombudsman. Um, there are 15 regional programs in New York State, 1,400 facilities, and 160,000 residents in long-term care that they oversee. We are so grateful to have you. And then a very special guest is Dr. Jane Carmody. Uh, Jane actually did not know she was going to be speaking until like a day ago. Uh, Jane is the Senior Program Officer of the John A. Hartford Foundation, which invests in aging experts and practice innovations that transform how the care of older adults is delivered. Since 1982, the John A. Harper Foundation has awarded more than 625 million in grants to enhance the health and well-being of older people. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to read a quote that you might be familiar with. It was in the film. It is a quote by Vince Pierce. It is part of his uh, Message to the higher powers, if you recall, and the quote is this. They say, everyone has a voice, but who can we really express our concerns to if someone in a higher power always denies the accusations? And with that, I would like to point to the two empty chairs in the room. The two empty chairs are two panelists who were supposed to be here and uh, were not. Well, they're just not. One is uh, a head nurse at Kohler who was informed that they are not allowed to speak by the administration. And the other one is a member of the Department of Health who was going to speak and then backed out on Friday with no explanation. So we, these are hard conversations and we need to have them. And I'm so, so grateful to the people who are here doing the hard thing and having these conversations. So let's give them an extra round of applause for that. Okay, and the last one, I give it to you. Do you want Beth to start? Oh, Beth is gonna participate, yes. Oh good, okay, oh great. Excuse me, is, it, is this being recorded? Yes, yeah. this is being recorded, so I'll make sure y'all get away. Hi, I'm not sure. Oh, it is working. Great. Uh, so again, I'm Richard Mollett. Um, and thanks, Miko, thanks so much for having me. And my, uh, just my hats off, if I had a hat, to both of you and to everyone who worked on this, on the program. It's really, really excellent. Uh, the first question I had is actually for everybody on the panel. And it's uh, given what we saw in the film and what we know about the experiences in many nursing homes, but not all nursing homes in New York and not all nursing homes in the country, could you please talk about where you see us going from here and what you see your role as an individual is in uh, making that happen? So if it's okay with you, Beth, I'll start off with you. Yeah, so, you know, oh, am I on? Okay. 
Hi, okay. So many of you may know AARP, we are really an advocacy group first and foremost. You know what we do about protecting Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, many of you may not know the extensive work that we do on uh, nursing home and nursing home quality and standards. Um, and so Richard, I'm sure we'll talk more about this and, and knows so much more than I do specifically in nursing homes. But you know, the stamping um, regulations, the requirements are the most important thing. And I, I keep referring back to this card and I thank you all for, for developing this because these, this data is very striking and it's data that we all, we all live with and we look at all the time. But we can see now the ramifications of what this data really means. And I think that that's the important part. So when we look at the new regs that the uh, minimum requirements for staffing the federal government is now talking about, you know, we're very concerned that in fact, it's not a step forward for New York. And so I think that's something that we all need to bring to the table and, and talk about. Thanks, thanks so much. So we've got the other end if that's okay and go to Francine. Um, we also, I can repeat it too if you want, sure. So. I was just saying that seeing you know all the experiences, your experiences, and the experiences of people of color, and knowing that so many nursing homes across the country, most nursing homes, were severely impacted. And by that, I mean the residents were severely impacted because people always talk about the nursing home, but I always try to think it's the residents that we care about, and the residents, of course, who were harmed the most. But not all nursing homes, um, not all nursing homes had death from COVID. Uh, if you could talk about where you see us going from here, uh, and where you see yourself and your role is uh, in making that happen. Uh, the 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 COVID has impacted us greatly at at COLA. Um, what I would like to see going forward is that we get our mental health looked after. Mm -hmm. We were we were enclosing rooms for over four hundred plus days. And many of us were going nuts. Mm -hmm. All we had to depend on was my fellow friends here and the rest of the group to call. Sometimes the calls were heartbreaking because it was another member of our family that died. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to see going forward is that we get a seat at the decision-making table. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to switch back and go to Claudette. First, I want to say that was very powerful. Um, the biggest thing to me is that's resident empowerment. That's what our program is. Advocate, empower, and educate. You guys were very empowered in this. In this. Um, I think going from here, that's exactly what we need to stay focused on, is empowering the residents. Our program is, is there to be your voice. We, so keep that in mind, reach out to your ombudsman program, work with your ombudsman so that they can bring your voice forward. Um, I think taking a focus on resident councils, hearing what they have to say about what they want in a facility, what they're looking for to improve the care that they're receiving, whether it's activities, food, being able to leave, <laughs> go outside, having you know good engagement and social engagement, community engagement and family engagement. And I think we need to stay focused on that moving forward. I think that the MPA, the, I'm sorry, Master Plan on Aging is focusing on that. Um, I'm on some of those committees, I'm definitely focusing on that and bringing the residents' voice to the table. So I want you to be aware of that. That's definitely a large focus for us. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. And Tito, if I go to you. Well, I would say, like, just like Francine said, there's on COVID. It was terrible. It was like before COVID, everything was fine in the nursing home. It was like a homely place. And after COVID, it just became almost like a nightmare. It, um, it affected me greatly, you know, like I got so almost, I got almost like institutionalized, mm -hmm. being close up so many days without seeing family, without being close to my loved one. And we need to change that. And I always like, you know, the staffing is like, they're not dedicated like they used to, they're getting overworked. 
they had it and it's affecting the residents. It's affecting us because we don't get the care that we should get and the, and the attention that we should get. And I think moving forward, we should like come up with a solution to let us be part of, you know, of the decision making. Because nobody could, like anybody from outside is now living what we live in. So it's better if we have the voice and people to hear us, that would be great because I think we will move forward and make things better. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that the, uh, the movie really showed how much you did. How much you, and in, in such dire circumstances where your voice was even more squelched than ever um, with the COVID pandemic. So it's tremendously powerful. Uh, Jane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you the same question last, but just one uh, additional thing. If you feel comfortable or able to, I, I'm thinking a lot about the NASM study, which I know the Harvard Foundation uh, strongly supported. Um, and so anything that you might want to mention from that, I think might be really of interest too. I will mention that um, I'm, I, I'm just in awe of this group that put this film together. Um, I met Peter, Pete, um, on a conference call. <laughs> That um, that Richard was part of the the whole uh, study and story that I'll tell you in just a minute. But uh, I met him there because um, our group moving forward coalition to improve the quality of lives in nursing homes. They were on a call. I don't know who all was on the call. I thought, who are these people? And that's right here <laughs> in our city. And so I was able to go to a, an event one night where they were, you know, having poetry and. Uh, and pictures and treats and it was fabulous it was fabulous so i was in awe and impressed and so when uh, when a colleague of mine harry said you've got to come and see this uh, i certainly did so let me go back so the foundation was actually founded in 1929 by the a and grocery store money so if anybody shop at a and grocery store <laughs> this is your foundation <laughs> um, and um, about in the 80s, though, as you mentioned, Nico, that that's when they really started focusing on older people. Prior to that, the um, founders and owners uh, of the of those grocery stores said, do the greatest good for the greatest number. So the foundation really focused more on older people across all settings. But I will tell you, not until COVID did we say, oh my goodness, what is going on in nursing homes? And so our president, Dr. Terry Fulmer, said something has to be done. So right away started, you know, calls with nursing homes trying to get um, equipment and, and knowledge about infection control, et cetera, going, but then recognize that a study, even though I know this, you're doing the hard work of living and breathing this, a study did need to be done um, with the National Academies of uh, Science and Medicine because one hadn't been done for 39 years on nursing homes. Well, things have changed, right? <laughs> and so this study was done great wonderful experts from all over the country, residents, the, the clinical staff. I'm a nurse myself and worked in nursing homes most of, most of my life. And, and so got them all together. So this is wonderful, we've got a study, right? So not to leave a study on a shelf, which can happen, really looked at doing something and we pulled together a group called the Moving Forward Coalition. Lots of discussion about that. But um, um, Alice Bonner, who leads that, is trying to pull together consumers and, um, and industry together, and everybody has a different voice about that, but it's really a coalition to try to do something today so that the work you went through is not in vain, and so that we can kind of continue that. So that's, I'll say others, but I don't want to take much more time, but thank you for the opportunity to be here today, even though I'm Second choice. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that many times, doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thanks so much. Uh, my next few questions are for Tito and Francine. Uh, and I'll start with, with you, Tito, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Um, if you could please tell us how you came to be a resident at Kohler and how long you've lived there. Well, actually, I've been in Kohler for a very long time. I last shot when I was young, when I was 22 years old, a young victim. And I was living in the Bronx, and I was in the nursing home in the Bronx. Then I moved to my mom's house. My mom's house, it was kind of hard because the only tenant was in coming inside. And you know, I got sick and I went to Bellevue. 
And the belly, I was like, you know, I need to go somewhere so my mom could get some peace, you know, like it was too much for her. So I, and I went to call her. And call her was looking, I'm like, wow, what is this? Where am I at? You know, it was kind of hard in the beginning, but then I got adjusted. And it was, excuse me. Oh. It was, um, it was awesome in the beginning because in Kola it was like a family. And I guess that's why I've been there so long. You know, it was like almost, you know, I was in Kola, it was homely, and the nurses was good to us. The food was kind of decent. And you know, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know it was almost a pleasure to stay there. Well, and, um, as the as the year went by, you know, like you know, once you acquired, you know, different things happened. I was like, a couple of times I tried um to leave, you know, go to get my apartment and stuff. Then stuff happened. Sandy Stone came. Was, <coughs> everything was like turned turned back. I put it back. A moon, and I you know I needed to stay there for longer to recuperate. And like I said, it was good. But once this pandemic hit, it was like, oh wow, this came all of a sudden like a nightmare, you know, like, like you know, like the nurses were getting too much work for them, too too little nurses, you know what I mean? It was a, a, a small amount for too many patients, and they couldn't do the work that it will, that they did with the, to their best quality because it was impossible. You can't. Give people care if you don't have the, the proper manpower, you know, and, um, and you start, start crazy, like, you know, I mean, after the pandemic, it really turned into, like, like I said, almost like a nightmare, you know what I mean? And now it's like slowly but surely, like, I mean, certain things have improved, but it still is not 100%, and I think it could be better. You know, like, if people get together, and we get more staff, and I guess the salary too, you know, because people need, you, you don't want to work if you're not getting paid properly. And if they increase the salary for someone work, I guess more than will get interested in getting jobs in the nursing facility, and it'd be better for us, for the residents. Because whatever they do, whatever they can't have, it affects us. We don't get the quality care we're supposed to get. And it's, it's just a shame, you know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Francine, the same question, uh, question to you. How you, if you would, uh, how you came to become a resident at Kohler? How long have you been there for? Um, I've been a resident at Kohler from 2006 up to present. I fell and damaged my back, back home in Antigua. And I came to this country to get, just to check it out and to get better. I had surgery, I got damaged at surgery. So it left me now in a wheelchair. But I've been trying my best to cope the best way that I can. Um, the, the PTOT has been very good. Um, it's, it's good to go, it's good to listen what they say because they can really help you. Cola Cola Water has been a great place. As Peter just said, we need more nurses. They are burned out and they are underpaid. Nursing is a very hard job. It has to come from within. You have to want to do it. No senior can want to go to a school six months and want to take care of people. You can't work. When you dedicate people and the ones that you have, they're so burnt out that they're just leaving. And rightfully, it, it is impacting our lives. So we want better staff. Sometimes the staff don't come, maybe on our unit, and then someone has become short and they take them away. So then it ends up going to be the same thing short of staff. 
and we can't keep working like this. It, it can't keep happening. You don't know. None of these guys in here that are walking, you leave your home and you never know if you'll go back. You may end up in a chair. Not because but you can live happy lives in a chair. Mm -hmm. we, want the, we want the same thing. We want to be treated with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. I know we have some patients that might abuse the nurses or you know shout at them, but I know many of them try their best. But we, we, we want to be treated well. Treat like somebody who walks on the street. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we did not uh, uh, choose to be in these chairs. Take life out of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you find that you, you're seeing the same, you have the same nurses and nurse aides consistently, or do they change around a lot? Basically, it's the same. That's great. Well, some of them, when well, they hear them, they, they come, some work, and then they leave. They hire new people. And before, like a lot of my said, I've been there so long, a lot of the aides and the nurses, they retired. <laughs> so the ones that are there now, they just begin to know you, and it's like the love is not the same, you know what I mean? It's not. Yeah. It takes time to build love and to, and being that, they're going through all this and you know, this COVID business really, really took a toll on everything. You know what I mean? Like, things have never been the same. Um, that actually leads into the next question I had, which was what was life in color like before, before the pandemic? Oh, before the pandemic, as Cleo just rightly said, it was like a family. Uh, you can't wait for your nurse to come back. But now there's so many new faces and it's like just a pain job for some of them. So they're, they're not treating us the way that we should be treated. You know, and, and that is what we want, change. We want dedicated, as I just said, we want dedicated people to look after us. Because nursing, it's a very hard job. Do you know, do you, do you, know, do you see if there's any um, onboarding, as they say, or training to help them acclimate and to better understand and to be more uh, attentive um, and thoughtful about their needs as residents there? Well, when we complain, when we complain at the resident council, I'm the president of our resident council, and when we do make complaints, our CEO and our head of nursing, Ms. Pascal, they, they always say they have um, these training sessions that they do, but um, lately we have been saying it seems if you go in one ear and come out the other way. Definitely, they, they, I think there should be more training for them to be more sensitive to our condition. Like some of them are not completely educated on everybody's condition. Like for me, for example, sometimes I may have a spasm in my leg, and a nurse will tell me, "Why are you trying to kick me?" I'm like. Wow, I can't control that. You know what I mean? So it's like, what if, you know, if they were to get a little bit more educated about people's condition, I think they would probably have more understanding and probably would have more sympathy for us and give them a little bit of better care like we deserve. Thank you. Great answer. Um, my next question is, thanks to the film we saw what life was like, in color during COVID, how has it changed since then? It hasn't changed much. Uh, I will go back to the shortage again of staff. That's what we are grappling with right now. And, and as we said, those other day, they, they really burnt out. And you know, um, it's not enough. You're not enough to go around. They try their best, but it's really hard. Do you know? Yeah, it's like it's too much work for them. It's too much the we do, you know, the residents, a lot of them have a lot of things and their issues, so it's hard to say to take care of everybody's issues. Especially if you not don't have the proper staff and the proper power, you know, people to work because they get they get wasted, they get tired, you know, and, 
And that affects all of us because we're going to as I said before, we're not getting the proper care we're supposed to get. Thank you. Well, what about um, other services? Like, well, how is the food? Has it, has has it changed between from before COVID to during COVID to now and well, occasional? Yeah, let's start with well, I, I gotta admit, I mean, the food is getting a little better. <laughs> it is getting a little better. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? And what are you doing now? Are they like buying stuff for us like once a week or twice a month from outside? You know, make us taste home, home like food. And it's, you know, yeah, that, that I, I could say that's has to improve just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have been fighting them for a year now. We want Sedesco to do better. Mm -hmm. They can do better. We are sick people in wheelchairs and we want to eat healthy. The food is being wasted because people cannot eat it. And we have been fighting with them. We got them for a meeting last November. It's almost a year. And there's not much changes. We want more vegetables and fruits. Mm -hmm. And the food presentation is the key. I told them already, food don't have to be sold for us to eat it. Present it good, and at least we'll eat some of it. Is it is are you eating in dining rooms or like is it back to regular dining and other socialization? Uh, no, but they still don't want us to to gamble together in in the day room. So we mostly eat in our rooms. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow, that's um, so. I was really interested in that because I know it was hard to even get out, as we saw in the film, to get out of the of the facility to get some fresh air and then to get out even beyond uh, again. So, to what extent are you able to do that now? Are you able to get out and get into the community? Oh, yes, yes. We, 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 we uh, get thanks to Vince. Even during the pandemic, he fought and he fought and he fought for us to go outside. It was really hard and he didn't take no for an answer. He said, We are going to the doors. Come hell or high water, we are going to the doors. If you're home. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thanks, Vince, for that. They really advocated for us, they fought for us. Because really it was like a hostage situation. <laughs> when we like, imagine, you know, we like we didn't actually be like this. We you know it's like we've been getting penalized for being in a wheelchair for being disabled. You know, I you know, taking you a big break from find from your family, uh, that was that was Unhumane, you know, it was definitely unhumane, and that's something that's gonna scar me for life. And you know, it's, I just hope with the years and days go by, you know, to get better mental wise and physical, but hopefully, we need help, we need help, we need, we need help for that. With, with, and that really raises a, a good question for me. Is there access to mental health services, whether it be through a therapist or maybe even art therapy or, or, or different things that you can do because it, you were in lockdown. I mean, it, it was it was harrowing for people who lived in, their, in the outside community, but, but to be in your bed and to have people that are that are in and out and not to have the control that, 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 that people do, it, it just, I think, accentuated and all that. So do you have access? Uh, yes, we, we do have access. We have Dr. Amin, I think in his department, he can um, take, he, he needs help as well. We have a very robust, uh, um, what's that called? Recreation therapist mm -hmm. that does help us. Um, we have puzzles, we have different things. Um, we have these TVs that we could go to and do stuff. So they, they do help us, the whole therapy department do help us. That's great. Tito, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I agree with um, Francine, the therapeutic department is awesome, but they do have a lot of activities now and different type of things to get into, you know, speak your mind of the things. And that, that's helping us a lot, you know, but there's still, there's more, we need more, you know, we need this. We definitely need more. You know, we need better quality of life, better quality of food, like Francine said. 
and you know, there's only one life. You know, let's you know, let's make our life a little bit at least a little bit better, you know what I mean? Because it's it's not easy to be like this. You know, it's not it's really not easy. And hope for changes, that's all. Thank you. Um, Beth had mentioned earlier about the um, the Biden administration um, is proposing staffing standards. Uh, New York State has staffing standards that have been in place, although they're not in effect for for two years. So they're they're in law, but they're not being implemented. And I was really curious. I actually looked it up this morning. Uh, Cola reports having a pretty high staffing ratio. So the federal, just for everyone's understanding. We talk about nursing staff in terms of RNs and the LPNs and CNAs per resident per day. And the average um, in the country, in New York is a little bit lower, the average is about 3.5, 3.6 hours per resident a day. That's what the New York law calls for. Kohler actually has, an, I think it was 4.59 hours per resident a day, so it's much, much higher. Um, but I can see from, one, from the rating, the rating for Kohler is very low on the federal website, and I can certainly see from the experiences that were so eloquently shown in the movie that residents don't have access to that care, uh, to that high level of care. So I was wondering, one which, I mean, you've talked a bit about this already, you know, about your experiences not having access to nursing services. And I would certainly, again, really talked about, you know, the pressure ulcers and people sitting in feces and, and not being bathed as, as I think it was a nurse or a person who was being interviewed for uh, many, many weeks, uh, et cetera. But what is your, I guess, what is your experience now in terms of sufficient nursing staff? And um, just any other thoughts you have in terms of just access and the care you're getting and, and the extent that it's helping you as a person? Well, the care we're getting now is like, well, to me it's different because um, I did recently came from the hospital and I had to change it on my body. And I was assigned to a different unit where most people are bed bound in. And you know, it's a little depressing for me to see everybody in bed like that, you know. And I'm one of the ones that get up like most people every day because if I stay in bed, you know, you know, the lungs get congested and so I mean they try, but like I said, they short staff and not much they can really do, like, you know what I mean? They they stressed out, the, the, the administration stressed them out, and of course, the chain reaction. They stress us out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that's right. Thank you, no, it's not right. Uh, what I see now, the, the, the case being rushed, is like the CNAs, they're rushing to get it done so they can sit on a phone. <laughs> and it's awful. You're doing care for someone and you're constantly on a cell phone. I don't get it. It's wrong. Disrespectful. Very, very disrespectful. Very disrespectful. It is not good at all. And we've been trying, the resident council have been trying, we've been complaining. Every meeting we meet once per month and we've been asking. Please ask them, put aside the cell phone until after the care. Phones are ringing while they're giving care. I sure who's gonna test. I can help myself with my care, but for someone like who's who needs care to get him out of bed, get him washed, I can go to the shower. So for me, it's fine. But even asking them to do something, it's, it is so hard. We need to get them off the cell phone. It, there's no penalty there. So they just think they can get away with it all the time. And we're tired of complaining. The cell phone, the cell phone has to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tito, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I want to ask something too. Like, like most of the nurses aid and you know, staff, they all come from foreign countries. And they all, most of them are from the same place. And they constantly speak in the language among us that we like confused. I'm like, what are they saying? And, and you know, and I don't think that's right. They should, they should leave that when they eat by themselves. And you know, it's like, that's, that's something that's been going on for years. 
and we can't have that happen. So we need more money in home and community based care and more money to support family caregivers. Last year we got an increase of nine million dollars at the state level. I think we asked for twenty. That tells you. Uh, we got a lot more work to do and it's it's, it's a tougher budget year this year in Albany. So but we're gonna be out there fighting. Okay. Well, I sort of said earlier that we can help <laughs> a lot of these things, but I, I think we talked, you mentioned money. I mean, money is important, but there's also things that can be done that don't take money. It doesn't take money for an aide to pay attention to you when they're giving care, to put their phone aside. That is not an impact of finances. That's an impact of good training for the staff, education on how to treat people as humans and not just a job and not just a widget or a room number. I mean, it's people we're taking care of. Those are things that don't, don't cost money, but they can make a giant impact on the care that you receive and how you feel your experience is in that facility. Things like food, changing condiments, changing, you know, can you have steak every day? Probably not, but could that be something accommodated into the menu if you work with the facility that, you know, some residents really would like this opportunity. How do we get there? That's not going to take on a significant cost. So that's where our program can work with residents and talk about those types of things. Not just things that cost money. Staff costs money, we need staff, I understand that, but there's also, there's the element of the quality of care that you're receiving from the people that are there. One staff can, that's really good and caring can be better than 10 that are sitting on their phone. So we have to consider those things and look at those um, pieces as being a very important part of the puzzle. Thank you so much. Um, oh my gosh. I will just want to say this. What the foundation is doing and has been is that is putting the improving the care of older adults first and foremost through age-friendly care caregiving and serious illness. I'm going to tell you about age-friendly care if you haven't heard about it. Um, they looked at all the practices because they're not reaching the people. They looked at all the practices and they kind of boiled it down to four basic things. Some people come out of fifth or sixth, but the four basic things are what matters most. That is what should drive everything we do in care. What matters most? Medication, um, meditation, mental health, you know, and mobility. You're in a wheelchair, but you're mobile. You're getting around, and that should be uh, first and foremost. So that's what we're doing. There's over 3,000 now that have become age-friendly champions and over 600 nursing homes. So if we could get every nursing home to do that, I think things would be better, because I agree with you. 10 staff that aren't held accountable for great care are not going to help. Secondly, I'd like to say this I see as carry out in the audience, that she's working hard that uh, essential, that family caregivers are essential, that never again should this happen. I love your sign that said, isolation kills too, right? So I appreciate the fight you're taking on. And thirdly, I would love to have Nursing Home Matter Live shirts and hats and, and <laughs> cards and where do we get them? So sign me up for that. All right. So it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Jane. That was a wonderful answer. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Miko. Yeah. Should I have a quick this? Is it on? Is it on? Oh, it's on. We have one special last treat for you, which is uh, Tio is going to read his poem that you'll see an excerpt of on the back of your card. Nursing home blues. Nursing home blues, people don't have a clue. But I go through on a regular, they just don't know what to do. The staff seems to forget. They could be in the same position, like they regret. They just here for the money, and that's a shame. The way they treat us is really unhumane. Leave me dirty for hours, this stuff has to stop. My body's breaking down, you think they care? I think not. I ring the bell to get help, and that doesn't work. The situation really seems to get really worse. There's no patient rights, that's a thing of the past. 
living here is like living fire to dry grass. Nursing home life matters as a straight up fact. I wish people get their things together and learn how to act. Ever since the pandemic, things have been the same. This shit is really, really messing with my brain. I wish someone would care. I need a helping hand. I really wish someone would really understand. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today, for having the hard conversations, and for showing up. Oh, my bad. I would like to leave a smile on your face. Oh. And give you my signature piece. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Wave your hands to the ones you love the best. Then shake hands with those nearby and greet them with a smile. There's a reason we call here sometimes. Um, and I would just like to make one more point. You were not second choice. You're like the surprise <laughs> in the popcorn box. Okay. That's true. Okay. Um, so I would love to take questions, but there's actually an event after this. So if you would all like, um, we can go forth and have conversations about how to do the right thing and honor the people and the stories in this film and carry this out into the world with our advocacy work. I am recommending that everyone gather, not the people on my stream, uh, at the Roxy Bar if you want to have more conversations and meet each other. But thank you all so, so very much.